In a continuously progressive society, healthcare professionals are at the forefront of leading and adapting to social change, particularly when it comes to understanding the trials and tribulations of the LGBT community. It is especially valuable to become sensitive to the healthcare concerns of transgendered individuals as it helps to protect a subpopulation of individuals who require a strong emotional support base. But then this begs the question, what exactly is trans care? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. No clue. Caring for people who are transgendered? What is trans care? I've never heard that word before. I think it's just recognizing issues that relate to transgender individuals in the healthcare system and trying to figure out how to address gaps in the system. Specialized medical care. Um, that is catered to the needs of individuals that identify or have, um, I guess, that are trans individuals and there needs to be more awareness. What is trans care? Let's break it down. Transgender specifically refers to someone who does not identify with the sex they were assigned at birth. This can include male to female, or M to F, or female to male, F to M. Care the maintenance and improvement of physical and mental health through the provision of medical services. Thus, trans care is providing health care to a transgender identifying individual, just as one would to any other individual encountered in practice. To learn more about how transgendered individuals experience health care, we spoke with an expert. This is Wes. I'm Wes, HIV prevention worker, and I happen to be trans. I was born female. I started my medical transition about four years ago, socially about six months before that. Transition is a self-defined thing. It's different for everybody. My transition meant hormone replacement therapy and some surgeries. Socially, it involved legal name change and that sort of thing, but transition is different for everybody. We are doctors, we're lawyers, we are volunteers, we are students. We are just as diverse of a population as our non-trans counterparts. 55% of trans people in the province of Ontario are living with a disability or chronic illness. 23% of trans people in Ontario are racialized. 19% of us are newcomers to Canada or were born outside of Canada. 27% of us are parents. 6% of us have some sort of intersex condition as well. We have a tendency to think that everything that happens to trans people is because they're trans. If you're my doctor and I'm coming to you for care, I need you to understand that there's just as wide an array of things that are going to be impacting my health as anybody else. 21% of trans people avoid the emergency room when they need it because they're trans. Oftentimes, by the time we're approaching our doctor or emergency care, you're our last resort and you're often the last place we want to be um, because of what we may have experienced with other healthcare providers prior to that. I think providing inclusive, competent care for trans people really starts the minute we walk in the door of your facility. Um, and I think a few really small changes could make a really big difference for somebody trying to access your services or somebody who's too afraid to access the services you're offering. Um, intake forms. We have a tendency to gender everything in a really binary way, check male or check female. What would it take to change a form to say maybe gender colon fill in the blank? And allowing somebody who maybe doesn't identify as male or female, maybe they feel that they're somewhere in between, or maybe they're in a period of transition and um, they identify other than those two things. I think that little change can make a big difference in the way that someone feels welcome or counted in their space. A lot of people make assumptions about our bodies and what body parts we have and how we feel about our body parts. It's safe to say that some trans people um, really don't like the body parts that they were born with. Some people really like the body parts that they were born with and sometimes you're indifferent and it changes from day to day. So really understand that it's not a prerequisite that we, that we hate the body we were born into. Gender um, has a very large mental construction as well. Anybody with a cervix requires a pap smear. There's lots of trans men that still have cervixes. 
it's important to recognize that cervical health is still an issue for trans men. So asking that question of your patients, do you have a cervix? Is this something that we should be concerned about? Anybody with breast tissue still needs to worry about breast health. Trans women, people who are born male and transition to female, hormones will give you breast tissue. You need to be worried about breast health. Trans men who have been on hormones, your breasts don't suddenly disappear. Breast health is still important. And even if you've had a mastectomy or chest surgery, as some of you might call it, there's still small amounts of breast tissue remaining. So talking about how to check yourself and how regularly trans people should be coming in for that kind of care. Trans women, you still have to worry about prostate health. That needs to be something that's on your agenda. If I, as a trans man, come in for a pap smear and I have a male health card, do you know how to build that through OKIP? Do you know the extra paperwork that's going to be required to do that? Very little information is available about trans folks and HIV, and it's not surprising because there's very little health research done on, on trans folks to begin with. Trans people have higher prevalence rates of HIV than other sexual minorities such as men who have sex with men. The fact is that 15% of trans people in Ontario, according to the Trans Pulse Project, have done sex work. We know that sex work is a high-risk trade. The more sexual partners you have, the higher your risk. We also know that it's a trade that there's no legal protections for folks that are doing sex work. So we really need to be looking at the numbers and looking at, you know, if somebody's going to your, your clinic to get an HIV test done, is there even the option for them to be counted as a transgender person getting the test done or do they have to check male or female? If we're not asking these questions and collecting these numbers, there's no way that we're ever going to have funds allocated to HIV prevention among transgender people. Your best first question for a trans patient is, what can I do for you today? What do you need for me today? And these are the first questions that you should be asking all your patients. It doesn't change because they're trans. As you can see, the demands on a physician to become more flexible, more knowledgeable, and more open-minded are greater than ever before. Yet, by simply including inclusive language in our intake forms, practicing trans-friendly physical examinations, and recording HIV data for trans individuals, we can truly pave the way to a healthier future. On behalf of Medical Queries presenting transgendered healthcare initiatives, we hope that this broadens your perspectives as the change in trans care begins with you.